There'll be another if we don't start off for chapel soon. It's a quarter to. There was a general move. Mike was the last to leave the room. As he was going, Jellicoe stopped him. Jellicoe was staying in that Sunday, owing to his ankle. I say said Jellicoe, I just wanted to thank you again about that, oh, that's all right. No, but it really was awfully decent of you. You might have got into a frightful row. Were you nearly caught? Jolly nearly. It was you who rang the bell, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But for goodness sake hey, don't go gassing about it, or somebody will get to hear who oughtn't he to, and I shall be sacked. All right. But, I say, you are a chap. What's the matter now? I mean about Sammy, you know. It's a jolly good score off old Downing. He'll be frightfully sick. Sammy, cried Mike. My good man, you don't think I did that, do you? What absolute rot. I never touched the poor brute. Oh, all right said Jellicoe. But I wasn't going to tell anyone, of course. What do you mean? You are a chap, giggled Jellicoe. Mike walked to chapel rather thoughtfully. Chaptic slay Mr. Downing on the scent there was just one moment, the moment in which, on going down to the junior day room of his house to quell an unseemly disturbance, he was boisterously greeted by a vermilion bull terrier, when Mr. Downing was seized with a hideous fear lest he had lost his senses. Glaring down at the crimson animal that was pawing at his knees, he clutched at his reason for one second as a drowning man clutches at a life belt. Then the happy laughter of the young onlookers reassured him. Who, he shouted, who has done this? Who, he shouted, who has done this? Please, sir. We don't know shrilled the chorus. Please, sir, he came in like that. Please, sir, we were sitting here when he suddenly ran in, all red. A voice from the crowd, look at old Sammy. The situation was impossible. There was nothing to be done. He could not find out by verbal inquiry who had painted the dog. The possibility of Sammy being painted red during the night had never occurred to Mr. Downing, and now that the thing had happened he had no scheme of action. As P. Smith would have said, he had confused the unusual with the impossible, and the result was that he was taken by surprise. While he was pondering on this the situation was rendered still more difficult by Sammy, who, taking advantage of the door being open, escaped and rushed into the road, thus publishing his condition to all and sundry. You can hush up a painted dog while it confines itself to your own premises, but once it has mixed with the great public this becomes out of the question. Sammy's state advanced from a private trouble into a row. Mr. Downing's next move was in the same direction that Sammy had taken, only, instead of running about the road, he went straight to the headmaster. The head, who had had to leave his house in the small hours in his pyjamas and a dressing gown, was not in the best of tempers. He had a cold in the head, and also a rooted conviction that Mr. Downing, in spite of his strict orders, 
had rung the bell himself on the previous night in order to test the efficiency of the school in saving themselves in the event of fire. He received the housemaster frostily, but thawed as the latter related the events which had led up to the ringing of the bell. Dear me, he said, deeply interested. One of the boys at the school, you think? I am certain of it said Mr. Downing. Was he wearing a school cap? He was bareheaded. A boy who breaks out of his house at night would hardly run the risk of wearing a distinguishing cap. No, no, I suppose not. A big boy, you say? Very big. You did not see his face. It was dark and he never looked back, he was in front of me all the time. Dear me. There is another matter, yes. This boy, whoever he was, had done something before he rang the bell, he had painted my dog Samson red. The headmaster's eyes protruded from their sockets. He, he, what? Mr. Downing. He painted my dog red, bright red. Mr. Downing was too angry to see anything humorous in the incident. Since the previous night he had been wounded in his tenderest feelings. His fire brigade system had been most shamefully abused by being turned into a mere instrument in the hands of a malefactor for escaping justice, and his dog had been held up to ridicule to all the world. He did not want to smile, he wanted revenge. The headmaster, on the other hand, did want to smile. It was not his dog. He could look on the affair with an unbiased eye, and to him there was something ludicrous in a white dog suddenly appearing as a red dog. It is a scandalous thing, said Mr. Downing. Quite so. Quite so, said the headmaster hastily. I shall punish the boy who did it most severely. I will speak to the school in the hall after chapel. Which he did, but without result. A cordial invitation to the criminal to come forward and be executed was received in wooden silence by the school, with the exception of Johnson III, of Outwards, who, suddenly reminded of Sammy's appearance by the headmaster's words broke into a wild screech of laughter, and was instantly awarded two hundred lines. The school filed out of the hall to their various lunches, and Mr. Downing was left with the conviction that, if he wanted the criminal discovered, he would have to discover him for himself. The great thing in affairs of this kind is to get a good start, and fate feeling perhaps that it had been a little hard upon Mr. Downing, gave him a most magnificent start. Instead of having to hunt for a needle in a haystack, he found himself in a moment in the position of being set to find it in a mere truss of straw. It was Mr. Outwood who helped him. Sergeant Collard had waylaid the archaeological expert on his way to chapel, and informed him that at close on twelve the night before he had observed a youth, unidentified, attempting to get into his house via the water pipe. Mr. Outwood, whose thoughts were occupied with apses and plinths, not to mention Cromlex, at the time thanked the sergeant with absent-minded politeness and passed on. Later he remembered the fact apropos of some reflections on the subject of burglars in medieval England, and passed it on to Mr. Downing as they walked back to lunch. Then the boy was in your house, 
exclaimed Mr. Downing. Not actually in, as far as I understand. I gather from the sergeant that he interrupted him before, I mean he must have been one of the boys in your house. But what was he doing out at that hour? He had broken out. Impossible, I think. Oh yes, quite impossible. I went round the dormitories as usual at eleven o'clock last night, and all the boys were asleep, all of them. Mr. Downing was not listening. He was in a state of suppressed excitement and exultation which made it hard for him to attend to his colleague's slow utterances. He had a clue. Now that the search had narrowed itself down to Outwood's house, the rest was comparatively easy. Perhaps Sergeant Collard had actually recognized the boy. Or reflection he dismissed this as unlikely, for the sergeant would scarcely have kept a thing like that to himself, but he might very well have seen more of him than he, Downing, had seen. It was only with an effort that he could keep himself from rushing to the sergeant then and there, and leaving the house lunch to look after itself. He resolved to go the moment that meal was at an end. Sunday lunch at a public school house is probably one of the longest functions in existence. It drags its slow length along like a languid snake, but it finishes in time. In due course Mr. Downing, after sitting still and eyeing with acute dislike everybody who asked for a second helping, found himself at liberty. Regardless of the claims of digestion, he rushed forth on the trail. Sergeant Collard lived with his wife and a family of unknown dimensions in the lodge at the school front gate. Dinner was just over when Mr. Downing arrived, as a blind man could have told. The sergeant received his visitor with dignity ejecting the family, who were torpid after roast beef and resented having to move, in order to ensure privacy. Having requested his host to smoke, which the latter was about to do unasked, Mr. Downing stated his case. Mr. Outwood, he said, tells me that last night, Sergeant, you saw a boy endeavouring to enter his house. The sergeant blew a cloud of smoke. Oh, 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 you're he said, I did, sir, spotted him, I did. Fee good at spotting, I am, sir. Duke of Connaught, he used to say, air comes sergeant Collard, he used to say, es fee good at spotting. What did you do? Do. Oh, oh, oh. I shout so, oh, oh, you your young monkey, what you're doing there. Yes. But he was off in a flash, and I doubles after imprompt. But you didn't catch him. No, sir, admitted the sergeant reluctantly. Did you catch sight of his face, sergeant? No, sir. He was doubling away in the opposite direction. Did you notice anything at all about his appearance? He was a long young chap, sir, with a pair of legs on him, fee flee fast he ran, sir. Oh oh oh, fee flee. You noticed nothing else? He wasn't wearing no cap of any sort, sir. Ah. Buried it, sir, added the sergeant, rubbing the point in. It was undoubtedly the same boy, undoubtedly. I wish you could have caught a glimpse of his face, sergeant. So do I, sir. 
You would not be able to recognize him again if you saw him, you think. Oh oh oh. Wouldn't go so far as to say that, sir, cause you'll see, I'm fiefly good at spotting, but it was a dark night. Mr. Downing rose to go. Well he said, the search is now considerably narrowed down, considerably. It is certain that the boy was one of the boys in Mr. Outwood's house. Young monkeys, interjected the sergeant helpfully. Good afternoon, sergeant. Good afternoon to you, sir. Pray do not move, sergeant. The sergeant had not shown the slightest inclination of doing anything of the kind. I will find my way out. Very hot today, is it not? Fiefly warm, sir, weather's going to break, working up for thunder. I hope not. The school plays the MCC on Wednesday, and it would be a pity if rain were to spoil our first fixture with them. Good afternoon. And Mr. Downing went out into the baking sunlight, while Sergeant Collard, having requested Mrs. Collard to take the children out for a walk at once, and furthermore to give young Ernie a clip side of the Eid, if he persisted in making so much noise, put a handkerchief over his face, rested his feet on the table, and slept the sleep of the just. Chapter Slate the Sleuth Hound for the Dr. Watsons of this world, as opposed to the Sherlock Holmeses, success in the province of detective work must always be, to a very large extent, the result of luck. Sherlock Holmes can extract a clue from a wisp of straw or a flake of cigar ash. But Dr. Watson has got to have it taken out for him, and dusted, and exhibited clearly, with a label attached. The average man is a Dr. Watson. We are wont to scoff in a patronizing manner at that humble follower of the great investigator, but, as a matter of fact, we should have been just as dull ourselves. We should not even have risen to the modest level of a Scotland Yard bungler. We should simply have hung around, saying, my dear Holmes, how, and all the rest of it, just as the downtrodden medico did. It is not often that the ordinary person has any need to see what he can do in the way of detection. He gets along very comfortably in the humdrum round of life without having to measure footprints and smile quiet, tight-lipped smiles. But if ever the emergency does arise, he thinks naturally of Sherlock Holmes, and his methods. Mr. Downing had read all the Holmes stories with great attention and had thought many times what an incompetent ass Dr. Watson was, but, now that he had started to handle his own first case, he was compelled to admit that there was a good deal to be said in extenuation of Watson's inability to unravel tangles. It certainly was uncommonly hard, he thought, as he paced the cricket field after leaving Sergeant Collard to detect anybody, unless you knew who had really done the crime. As he brooded over the case in hand, his sympathy for Dr. Watson increased with every minute, and he began to feel a certain resentment against Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It was all very well for Sir Arthur to be so shrewd and infallible about tracing a mystery to its source but he knew perfectly well who had done the thing before he started. Now that he began really to look into this matter of the alarm bell and the painting of Sami, 
the conviction was creeping over him that the problem was more difficult than a casual observer might imagine. He had got as far as finding that his quarry of the previous night was a boy in Mr. Outwood's house, but how was he to get any farther? That was the thing. There were, of course, only a limited number of boys in Mr. Outwood's house as tall as the one he had pursued, but even if there had been only one other, it would have complicated matters. If you go to a boy and say, either you or Jones were out of your house last night at twelve o'clock the boy does not reply, Sir, I cannot tell a lie, I was out of my house last night at twelve o'clock. He simply assumes the animated expression of a stuffed fish, and leaves the next move to you. It is practically stalemate. All these things passed through Mr. Downing's mind as he walked up and down the cricket field that afternoon. What he wanted was a clue. But it is so hard for the novice to tell what is a clue and what isn't. Probably, if he only knew, there were clues lying all over the place, shouting to him to pick them up. What with the oppressive heat of the day and the fatigue of hard thinking, Mr. Downing was working up for a brainstorm, when fate once more intervened, this time in the shape of Reglet, a junior member of his house. Reglet slunk up in the shamefaced way peculiar to some boys, even when they have done nothing wrong, and... Having capped Mr. Downing with the air of one who has been caught in the act of doing something particularly shady, requested that he might be allowed to fetch his bicycle from the shed. Your bicycle, snapped Mr. Downing. Much thinking had made him irritable. What do you want with your bicycle? Reglet shuffled stood first on his left foot, then on his right, blushed, and finally remarked, as if it were not so much a sound reason as a sort of feeble excuse for the low and blackguardly fact that he wanted his bicycle, that he had got leave for tea that afternoon. Then Mr. Downing remembered. Reglet had an aunt resident about three miles from the school, whom he was accustomed to visit occasionally on Sunday afternoons during the term. He felt for his bunch of keys, and made his way to the shed, Reglet shambling behind at an interval of two yards. Mr. Downing unlocked the door, and there on the floor was the clue. A clue that even Dr. Watson could not have overlooked. Mr. Downing saw it, but did not immediately recognize it for what it was. What he saw at first was not a clue, but just a mess. He had a tidy soul and abhorred messes. And this was a particularly messy mess. The greater part of the flooring in the neighborhood of the door was a sea of red paint. The tin from which it had flowed was lying on its side in the middle of the shed. The air was full of the pungent scent. Pa, said Mr. Downing. Then suddenly, beneath the disguise of the mess, he saw the clue. A footmark. No less. A crimson footmark on the grey concrete. Reglet, who had been waiting patiently two yards away, now coughed plaintively. The sound recalled Mr. Downing to mundane matters. Get your bicycle, Reglet, he said, and be careful where you tread. Somebody has upset a pot of paint on the floor. Reglet. Walking delicately through dry places, extracted his bicycle from the rack, 
and presently departed to gladden the heart of his aunt, leaving Mr. Downing, his brain fizzing with the enthusiasm of the detective, to lock the door and resume his perambulation of the cricket field. Give Dr. Watson a fair start, and he is a demon at the game. Mr. Downing's brain was now working with a rapidity and clearness which a professional sleuth might have envied. Paint. Red paint. Obviously the same paint with which Sammy had been decorated. A footmark. Whose footmark? Plainly that of the criminal who had done the deed of decoration. Y-O-I-C-K-S. There were two things, however, to be considered. Your careful detective must consider everything. In the first place, the paint might have been upset by the ground man. It was the ground man's paint. He had been giving a fresh coating to the woodwork in front of the pavilion scoring box at the conclusion of yesterday's match. A labor of love which was the direct outcome of the enthusiasm for work which Adair had instilled into him. In that case the footmark might be his. Note 1, interview the ground man on this point. In the second place Adair might have upset the tin and trodden in its contents when he went to get his bicycle in order to fetch the doctor for the suffering McPhee. This was the more probable of the two contingencies, for it would have been dark in the shed when Adair went into it. Note to interview Adair as to whether he found, on returning to the house, that there was paint on his boots. Things were moving. He resolved to take a dare first. He could get the ground man's address from him. Passing by the trees under whose shade Mike and Smith and Dunster had watched the match on the previous day, he came upon the head of his house in a deck chair reading a book. A summer Sunday afternoon is the time for reading in deck chairs. Oh, Adair, he said. No, don't get up. I merely wished to ask you if you found any paint on your boots when you returned to the house last night. Paint, sir. Adair was plainly puzzled. His book had been interesting and had driven the Sammy incident out of his head. I see somebody has spilled some paint on the floor of the bicycle shed. You did not do that, I suppose, when you went to fetch your bicycle. No, sir. It is spilled all over the floor. I wondered whether you had happened to tread in it. But you say you found no paint on your boots this morning. No, sir, my bicycle is always quite near the door of the shed. I didn't go into the shed at all. I see. Quite so. Thank you, Adair. Oh, by the way, Adair, where does Mark B. live? I forget the name of his cottage. Sir, but I could show you in a second. It's one of those cottages just past the school gates, on the right as you turn out into the road. There are three in a row. His is the first you come to. There's a barn just before you get to them. Thank you. I shall be able to find them. I should like to speak to Mark before a moment on a small matter. A sharp walk took him to the cottages Adair had mentioned. He rapped at the door of the first, and the ground man came out in his shirt sleeves, blinking as if he had just woke up, as was indeed the case. Oh, Mark B. 
sir. You remember that you were painting the scoring box in the pavilion last night after the match? Yes, sir. It wanted a lick of paint bad. The young gentleman will scramble about and get through the window. Makes it look shabby, sir. So I thought I'd better give it a coating so as to look ship-shape when the Mariliban come down. Just so. An excellent idea. Tell me, Mark B., what did you do with the pot of paint when you had finished? Put it in the bicycle shed, sir. On the floor. On the floor, sir. No. On the shelf at the far end, with the can of whitening what I use for marking out the wickets, sir. Of course, yes. Quite so. Just as I thought. Do you want it, sir? No, thank you, Mark B., no, thank you. The fact is. Somebody who had no business to do so has moved the pot of paint from the shelf to the floor, with the result that it has been kicked over, and spilt. You had better get some more tomorrow. Thank you, Mark B. That is all I wished to know. Mr. Downing walked back to the school thoroughly excited. He was hot on the scent now. The only other possible theories had been tested and successfully exploded. The thing had become simple to a degree. All he had to do was to go to Mr. Outwood's house. The idea of searching a fellow master's house did not appear to him at all a delicate task. Somehow one grew unconsciously to feel that Mr. Outwood did not really exist as a man capable of resenting liberties, find the paint-splashed boot, ascertain its owner, and denounce him to the headmaster. Picture, blue fire and God save the king by the full strength of the company. There could be no doubt that a paint-splashed boot must be in Mr. Outwood's house somewhere. A boy cannot tread in a pool of paint without showing some signs of having done so. It was Sunday, too, so that the boot would not yet have been cleaned. Y-O-I-C-K-S Also Tallaho. This really was beginning to be something like business. Regardless of the heat, the sleuth hound hurried across to Outwoods as fast as he could walk. Chapter Xlixer check the only two members of the house not out in the grounds when he arrived were Mike and Psmith. They were standing on the gravel drive in front of the boys' entrance. Mike had a deck chair in one hand and a book in the other. Psmith, for even the greatest minds will sometimes unbend, was playing Diabolo. That is to say, he was trying without success to raise the spool from the ground. There's a kid in France said Mike disparagingly, as the bobbin rolled off the string for the fourth time who can do it 3,700 and something times. Psmith smoothed a crease out of his waistcoat and tried again. He had just succeeded in getting the thing to spin when Mr. Downing arrived. The sound of his footsteps disturbed Psmith and brought the effort to nothing. Enough of this spooler, he said he flinging the sticks through the open window of the senior day room. I was an ass ever to try it. The philosophical mind needs complete repose in its hours of leisure. Hello. He stared after the sleuth hound, who had just entered the house. What the dickens said Mike, 
does he mean by barging in as if he'd bought the place? Comrade Downing looks pleased with himself. What brings him round in this direction, I wonder? Still, no matter. The few articles which he may sneak from our study are of inconsiderable value. He is welcome to them. Do you feel inclined to wait a while till I have fetched a chair and book? I'll be going on. I shall be under the trees at the far end of the ground. Tease well. I will be with you in about two ticks. Mike walked on towards the field, and Smith, strolling upstairs to fetch his novel, found Mr. Downing standing in the passage with the air of one who has lost his bearings. A warm afternoon, Sir murmured P. Smith courteously, as he passed. Er, uh, Smith. Sir. I, er, uh, wish to go round the dormitories. It was P. Smith as guiding rule in life never to be surprised at anything, so he merely inclined his head gracefully, and said nothing. I should be glad if you would fetch the keys and show me where the rooms are. With acute pleasure, sir said P. Smith. Or shall I fetch Mr. Outward, sir? Do as I tell you, Smith snapped Mr. Downing. P. Smith said no more, but went down to the matron's room. The matron being out. He abstracted the bunch of keys from her table and rejoined the master. Shall I lead the way, sir? he asked. Mr. Downing nodded. Here, sir, said P. Smith, opening a door, we have Barnes Dormitory. An airy room, constructed on the soundest hygienic principles. Each boy, I understand has quite a considerable number of cubic feet of air all to himself. It is Mr. Outward's boast that no boy has ever asked for a cubic foot of air in vain. He argues justly, he broke off abruptly and began to watch the other's manoeuvres in silence. Mr. Downing was peering rapidly beneath each bed in turn. Are you looking for Barnes, sir? inquired P. Smith politely. I think he's out in the field. Mr. Downing rose, having examined the last bed, crimson in the face with the exercise. Show me the next dormitory, Smith, he said, panting slightly. This said P. Smith opening the next door and sinking his voice to an awed whisper, is where I sleep. Mr. Downing glanced swiftly beneath the three beds. Excuse me, sir, said P. Smith, but are we chasing anything? Be good enough, Smith said Mr. Downing with asperity, to keep your remarks to yourself. I was only wondering, Sir. Shall I show you the next in order? Certainly. They moved on up the passage. Drawing blank at the last dormitory, Mr. Downing paused, baffled. P. Smith waited patiently by. An idea struck the master. The studies, Smith he cried. Aha! said P. Smith. I beg your pardon, sir. The observation escaped me unawares. The frenzy of the chase is beginning to enter into my blood. Here we have, Mr. Downing stopped short. Is this impertinence studied, Smith? Ferguson's study, sir. No, sir. That's further down the passage. This is Barnes. Mr. Downing looked at him closely. 
Smithers' face was wooden in its gravity. The master snorted suspiciously, then moved on. Whose is this? he asked, rapping a door. This, sir, is mine and Jackson's. What? Have you a study? You are low down in the school for it. I think, sir, that Mr. Outwood gave it us rather as a testimonial to our general worth than to our proficiency in school work. Mr. Downing raked the room with a keen eye. The absence of bars from the window attracted his attention. Have you no bars to your windows here, such as there are in my house? There appears to be no bar, Sir said Smith, putting up his eyeglass. Mr. Downing was leaning out of the window. A lovely view, is it not, Sir, said Smith. The trees, the field, the distant hills, Mr. Downing suddenly started. His eye had been caught by the water pipe at the side of the window. The boy whom Sergeant Collard had seen climbing the pipe must have been making for this study. He spun round and met Psmith's blandly inquiring gaze. He looked at Psmith carefully for a moment. No. The boy he had chased last night had not been Psmith. That exquisite's figure and general appearance were unmistakable, even in the dusk. Whom did you say you shared this study with, Smith? Jackson, sir. The cricketer. Never mind about his cricket, Smith said Mr. Downing with irritation. No, sir. He is the only other occupant of the room. Yes, sir. Nobody else comes into it. If they do, they go out extremely quickly, sir. Ah. Thank you, Smith. Not at all, sir. Mr. Downing pondered. Jackson. The boy bore him a grudge. The boy was precisely the sort of boy to revenge himself by painting the dog Sammy. And, gadzooks. The boy whom he had pursued last night had been just about Jackson's size and build. Mr. Downing was as firmly convinced at that moment that Mike's had been the hand to wield the paintbrush as he had ever been of anything in his life. Smith, he said excitedly. On the spot, sir said Smith affably. Where are Jackson's boots? There are moments when the giddy excitement of being right on the trail causes the amateur, or Watsonian, detective to be incautious. Such a moment came to Mr. Downing then. If he had been wise, he would have achieved his object, the getting a glimpse of Mike's boots, by a devious and snaky route. As it was, he rushed straight on. His boots, sir. He has them on. I noticed them as he went out just now. Where is the pair he wore yesterday? Where are the boots of yesteryear, murmured Smith to himself. I should say at a venture, sir, that they would be in the basket downstairs. Edmund, our genial knife and boot boy collects them, I believe, at early dawn. Would they have been cleaned yet? If I know Edmund, sir, no. Smith said Mr. Downing, trembling with excitement, go and bring that basket to me here. Smith's brain was working rapidly as he went downstairs. What exactly was at the back of the sleuth's mind, 
prompting these maneuvers, he did not know. But that there was something, and that that something was directed in a hostile manner against Mike, probably in connection with last night's wild happenings, he was certain. Smith had noticed, on leaving his bed at the sound of the alarm bell, that he and Jellico were alone in the room. That might mean that Mike had gone out through the door when the bell sounded, or it might mean that he had been out all the time. It began to look as if the latter solution were the correct one. He staggered back with the basket, painfully conscious the while that it was creasing his waistcoat, and dumped it down on the study floor. Mr. Downing stooped eagerly over it. Smith leaned against the wall, and straightened out the damaged garment. We have here, sir he said, a fair selection of our various bootings. Mr. Downing looked up. You dropped none of the boots on your way up, Smith. Not one, sir. It was a fine performance. Mr. Downing uttered a grunt of satisfaction, and bent once more to his task. Boots flew about the room. Mr. Downing knelt on the floor beside the basket, and dug like a terrier at a rat hole. At last he made a dive, and, with an exclamation of triumph, rose to his feet. In his hand he held a boot. Put those back again, Smith he said. The Exitonian, wearing an expression such as a martyr might have worn on being told off for the stake, began to pick up the scattered footgear, whistling softly the tune of I do all the dirty work as he did so. That's the lot, sir he said, rising. Ah. Now come across with me to the headmaster's house. Leave the basket here. You can carry it back when you return. Shall I put back that boot, sir? Certainly not. I shall take this with me, of course. Shall I carry it, sir? Mr. Downing reflected. Yes. Smith he said. I think it would be best. It occurred to him that the spectacle of a housemaster wandering abroad on the public highway, carrying a dirty boot, might be a trifle undignified. You never knew whom you might meet on Sunday afternoon. Smith took the boot, and doing so, understood what before had puzzled him. Across the toe of the boot was a broad splash of red paint. He knew nothing, of course, of the upset tin in the bicycle shed, but when a housemaster's dog has been painted red in the night, and when, on the following day, the housemaster goes about in search of a paint-splashed boot, one puts two and two together. Smith looked at the name inside the boot. It was Brown, Bootmaker, Bridge North. Bridge North was only a few miles from his own home and Mike's. Undoubtedly it was Mike's boot. Can you tell me whose boot that is? asked Mr. Downing. Smith looked at it again. No, sir. I can't say the little chap's familiar to me. Come with me, then. Mr. Downing left the room. After a moment Smith followed him. The headmaster was in his garden. Thither Mr. Downing made his way, the boot bearing Smith in close attendance. The head listened to the amateur detective's statement with interest. Indeed, he said, when Mr. Downing had finished. 
Indeed. Dear me. It certainly seems, it is a curiously well-connected thread of evidence. You are certain that there was red paint on this boot you discovered in Mr. Outwood's house. I have it with me. I brought it on purpose to show to you. Smith. Sir. You have the boot. Ah said the headmaster, putting on a pair of pince-nez, now let me look at, this, you say, is the. Just so. Just so. Just. But, er, uh, Mr. Downing, it may be that I have not examined this boot with sufficient care, but. Can you point out to me exactly where this paint is that you speak of? Mr. Downing stood staring at the boot with a wild, fixed stare. Of any suspicion of paint, red or otherwise, it was absolutely and entirely innocent. Chapter L The Destroyer of Evidence The boot became the center of attraction, the sinosure of all eyes. Mr. Downing fixed it with the piercing stare of one who feels that his brain is tottering. The headmaster looked at it with a mildly puzzled expression. Smith, putting up his eyeglass, gazed at it with a sort of affectionate interest, as if he were waiting for it to do a trick of some kind. Mr. Downing was the first to break the silence. There was paint on this boot, he said vehemently. I tell you there was a splash of red paint across the toe. Smith will bear me out in this. Smith, you saw the paint on this boot. Paint, sir. What? Do you mean to tell me that you did not see it? No, sir. There was no paint on this boot. This is foolery. I saw it with my own eyes. It was a broad splash right across the toe. The headmaster interposed. You must have made a mistake, Mr. Downing. There is certainly no trace of paint on this boot. These momentary optical delusions are I fancy, not uncommon. Any doctor will tell you, I had an aunt, sir said Smith chattily, who was remarkably subject, it is absurd. I cannot have been mistaken said Mr. Downing. I am positively certain the toe of this boot was red when I found it. It is undoubtedly black now, Mr. Downing. A sort of chameleon boot murmured Smith. The goaded housemaster turned on him. What did you say, Smith? Did I speak, sir, said Smith, with the start of one coming suddenly out of a trance. Mr. Downing looked searchingly at him. You had better be careful, Smith. Yes. Sir, I strongly suspect you of having something to do with this. Really, Mr. Downing said the headmaster, that is surely improbable. Smith could scarcely have cleaned the boot on his way to my house. On one occasion I inadvertently spilled some paint on a shoe of my own. I can assure you that it does not brush off. It needs a very systematic cleaning before all traces are removed. Exactly, sir said Smith. My theory, if I may. Certainly, Smith. P Smith bowed courteously and proceeded. My theory, sir, is that Mr. Downing was deceived by the light and shade effects on the toe of the boot. The afternoon sun, streaming in through the window, 
must have shone on the boot in such a manner as to give it a momentary and fictitious aspect of redness. If Mr. Downing recollects, he did not look long at the boot. The picture on the retina of the eye, consequently, had not time to fade. I remember thinking myself, at the moment, that the boot appeared to have a certain reddish tint. The mistake, bah, said Mr. Downing shortly. Well, really said the headmaster, it seems to me that that is the only explanation that will square with the facts. A boot that is really smeared with red paint does not become black of itself in the course of a few minutes. You are very right, sir said P. Smith with benevolent approval. May I go now, sir? I am in the middle of a singularly impressive passage of Cicero's speech de Senectute. I am sorry that you should leave your preparation till Sunday, Smith. It is a habit of which I altogether disapprove. I am reading it, sir said P. Smith, with simple dignity, for pleasure. Shall I take the boot with me, sir? If Mr. Downing does not want it. The housemaster passed the fraudulent piece of evidence to P. Smith without a word, and the latter, having included both masters in a kindly smile, left the garden. Pedestrians who had the good fortune to be passing along the road between the housemaster's house and Mr. Outwood's at that moment saw what, if they had but known it, was a most unusual sight, the spectacle of P. Smith running. P. Smith's usual mode of progression was a dignified walk. He believed in the contemplative style rather than the hustling. On this occasion, however, reckless of possible injuries to the crease of his trousers, he raced down the road, and turning in at Outwood's gate, bounded upstairs like a highly trained professional athlete. On arriving at the study, his first act was to remove a boot from the top of the pile in the basket, place it in the small cupboard under the bookshelf, and lock the cupboard. Then he flung himself into a chair and panted. Brain, he said to himself approvingly, is what one chiefly needs in matters of this kind. Without brain, where are we? In the soup, every time. The next development will be when Comrade Downing thinks it over and is struck with the brilliant idea that it's just possible that the boot he gave me to carry and the boot I did carry were not one boot but two boots. Meanwhile, he dragged up another chair for his feet and picked up his novel. He had not been reading long when there was a footstep in the passage, and Mr. Downing appeared. The possibility in fact the probability, of P. Smith having substituted another boot for the one with the incriminating splash of paint on it had occurred to him almost immediately on leaving the headmaster's garden. P. Smith and Mike, he reflected, were friends. P. Smith's impulse would be to do all that lay in his power to shield Mike. Feeling aggrieved with himself that he had not thought of this before, he, too, hurried over to Outwards. Mr. Downing was brisk and peremptory. I wish to look at these boots again, he said. P. Smith, with a sigh, laid down his novel, and rose to assist him. Sit down, Smith said the housemaster. I can manage without your help. P. Smith sat down again, carefully tucking up the knees of his trousers, and watched him with silent interest through his eyeglass. 
The scrutiny irritated Mr. Downing. Put that thing away, Smith, he said. That thing, sir. Yes, that ridiculous glass. Put it away. Why, sir? Why? Because I tell you to do so. I guessed that that was the reason, sir, sighed Smith, replacing the eyeglass in his waistcoat pocket. He rested his elbows on his knees, and his chin on his hands, and resumed his contemplative inspection of the boot expert, who, after fidgeting for a few moments, lodged another complaint. Don't sit there staring at me, Smith. I was interested in what you were doing, sir. Never mind. Don't stare at me in that idiotic way. May I read, sir? asked Smith, patiently. Yes, read if you like. Thank you, sir. Smith took up his book again, and Mr. Downing, now thoroughly irritated, pursued his investigations in the boot basket. He went through it twice, but each time without success. After the second search, he stood up, and looked wildly round the room. He was as certain as he could be of anything that the missing piece of evidence was somewhere in the study. It was no use asking Psmith point-blank where it was, for Psmith's ability to parry dangerous questions with evasive answers was quite out of the common. His eye roamed about the room. There was very little cover there, even for so small a fugitive as a number nine boot. The floor could be acquitted, on sight, of harboring the quarry. Then he caught sight of the cupboard, and something seemed to tell him that there was the place to look. Smith, he said. Smith had been reading placidly all the while. Yes, sir. What is in this cupboard? That cupboard, sir. Yes. This cupboard. Mr. Downing rapped the door irritably. Just a few odd trifles, sir. We do not often use it. A ball of string, perhaps. Possibly an old notebook. Nothing of value or interest. Open it. I think you will find that it is locked, sir. Unlock it. But where is the key, sir? Have you not got the key? If the key is not in the lock, sir, you may depend upon it that it will take a long search to find it. Where did you see it last? It was in the lock yesterday morning. Jackson might have taken it. Where is Jackson? Out in the field somewhere. Sir. Mr. Downing thought for a moment. I don't believe a word of it, he said shortly. I have my reasons for thinking that you are deliberately keeping the contents of that cupboard from me. I shall break open the door. P Smith got up. I'm afraid you mustn't do that, sir. Mr. Downing stared. Amazed. Are you aware whom you are talking to, Smith? He inquired acidly. Yes, sir. And I know it's not Mr. Outward, to whom that cupboard happens to belong. If you wish to break it open, you must get his permission. He is the sole lessee and proprietor of that cupboard. I am only the acting manager. Mr. Downing paused. He also reflected. Mr. Outwood in the general rule did not count much in the scheme of things, 
but possibly there were limits to the treating of him as if he did not exist. To enter his house without his permission and search it to a certain extent was all very well. But when it came to breaking up his furniture, perhaps. On the other hand, there was the maddening thought that if he left the study in search of Mr. Outwood, in order to obtain his sanction for the housebreaking work which he proposed to carry through, Smith would be alone in the room. And he knew that, if Smith were left alone in the room, he would instantly remove the boot to some other hiding place. He thoroughly disbelieved the story of the lost key. He was perfectly convinced that the missing boot was in the cupboard. He stood chewing these thoughts for a while, Smith in the meantime standing in a graceful attitude in front of the cupboard, staring into vacancy. Then he was seized with a happy idea. Why should he leave the room at all? If he sent Smith then he himself could wait and make certain that the cupboard was not tampered with. Smith, he said, go and find Mr. Outward, and ask him to be good enough to come here for a moment. Chapter Lee mainly about boots be quick, Smith, he said, as the latter stood looking at him without making any movement in the direction of the door. Quick, sir said P. Smith meditatively, as if he had been asked a conundrum. Go and find Mr. Outwood at once. P. Smith still made no move. Do you intend to disobey me, Smith? Mr. Downing's voice was steely. Yes, sir. What? Yes, sir. There was one of those you could have heard a pin drop silences. P. Smith was staring reflectively at the ceiling. Mr. Downing was looking as if at any moment he might say, thwarted to me face, ha, ha. And by a very stripling. It was P. Smith, however, who resumed the conversation. His manner was almost too respectful, which made it all the more a pity that what he said did not keep up the standard of docility. I take my stand, he said, on a technical point. I say to myself, Mr. Downing is a man I admire as a human being and respect as a master. In, this impertinence is doing you no good, Smith. Smith waved a hand deprecatingly. If you will let me explain, sir. I was about to say that in any other place but Mr. Outwood's house, your word would be law. I would fly to do your bidding. If you pressed a button, I would do the rest. But in Mr. Outwood's house I cannot do anything except what pleases me or what is ordered by Mr. Outwood. I ought to have remembered that before. One cannot he continued, as who should say, let us be reasonable one cannot, to take a parallel case. Imagine the colonel commanding the garrison at a naval station going on board a battleship and ordering the crew to splice the jibboom spanker. It might be an admirable thing for the Empire that the jibboom spanker should be spliced at that particular juncture, but the crew would naturally decline to move in the matter until the order came from the commander of the ship. So in my case, if you will go to Mr. Outward, and explain to him how matters stand, and come back and say to me, P. Smith, Mr. Outward wishes you to ask him to be good enough to come to this study then I shall be only too glad to go and find him. You see my difficulty, sir. 
Go and fetch Mr. Outwood, Smith. I shall not tell you again. P Smith flicked a speck of dust from his coat sleeve. Very well, Smith. I can assure you, sir, at any rate, that if there is a boot in that cupboard now, there will be a boot there when you return. Mr. Downing stalked out of the room. But added P Smith pensively to himself, as the footsteps died away, I did not promise that it would be the same boot. He took the key from his pocket, unlocked the cupboard, and took out the boot. Then he selected from the basket a particularly battered specimen. Placing this in the cupboard, he relocked the door. His next act was to take from the shelf a piece of string. Attaching one end of this to the boot that he had taken from the cupboard, he went to the window. His first act was to fling the cupboard key out into the bushes. Then he turned to the boot. On a level with the sill the water pipe, up which Mike had started to climb the night before, was fastened to the wall by an iron band. He tied the other end of the string to this, and let the boot swing free. He noticed with approval, when it had stopped swinging, that it was hidden from above by the window sill. He returned to his place at the mantelpiece. As an afterthought he took another boot from the basket, and thrust it up the chimney. A shower of soot fell into the grate blackening his hand. The bathroom was a few yards down the corridor. He went there, and washed off the soot. When he returned, Mr. Downing was in the study, and with him Mr. Outward, the latter looking dazed, as if he were not quite equal to the intellectual pressure of the situation. Where have you been, Smith? asked Mr. Downing sharply. I have been washing my hands, sir. H.M., said Mr. Downing suspiciously. Yes, I saw Smith go into the bathroom, said Mr. Outwood. Smith, I cannot quite understand what it is Mr. Downing wishes me to do. My dear Outwood snapped the salute. I thought I had made it perfectly clear. Where is the difficulty? I cannot understand why you should suspect Smith of keeping his boots in a cupboard, and added Mr. Outwood with spirit, catching sight of a good gracious has the man no sense look on the other's face, why he should not do so if he wishes it. Exactly, sir said Smith approvingly. You have touched the spot. If I must explain again, my dear Outward, will you kindly give me your attention for a moment? Last night a boy broke out of your house, and painted my dog Samson red. He painted, said Mr. Outward, round-eyed. Why? I don't know why. At any rate, he did. During the escapade one of his boots was splashed with the paint. It is that boot which I believe Smith to be concealing in this cupboard. Now, do you understand? Mr. Outwood looked amazedly at Smith, and P Smith shook his head sorrowfully at Mr. Outwood. P Smith's expression said, as plainly as if he had spoken the words, we must humor him. So with your permission, as Smith declares that he has lost the key, I propose to break open the door of this cupboard. Have you any objection? Mr. Outwood started. Objection? None at all, my dear fellow, none at all. Let me see. 
what is it you wish to do? This said Mr. Downing shortly. There was a pair of dumbbells on the floor, belonging to Mike. He never used them, but they always managed to get themselves packed with the rest of his belongings on the last day of the holidays. Mr. Downing seized one of these, and delivered two rapid blows at the cupboard door. The wood splintered. A third blow smashed the flimsy lock. The cupboard, with any skeletons it might contain, was open for all to view. Mr. Downing uttered a cry of triumph, and tore the boot from its resting place. I told you he said. I told you. I wondered where that boot had got to said Smith. I've been looking for it for days. Mr. Downing was examining his find. He looked up with an exclamation of surprise and wrath. This boot has no paint on it he said, glaring at P. Smith. This is not the boot. It certainly appears, sir said P. Smith sympathetically, to be free from paint. There's a sort of reddish glow just there, if you look at it sideways he added helpfully. Did you place that boot there, Smith? I must have done. Then, when I lost the key, are you satisfied now, Downing, interrupted Mr. Outwood with asperity, or is there any more furniture you wish to break? The excitement of seeing his household goods smashed with a dumbbell had made the archaeological student quite a swashbuckler for the moment. A little more, and one could imagine him giving Mr. Downing a good, hard knock. The sleuth hound stood still for a moment, baffled. But his brain was working with the rapidity of a buzzsaw. A chance remark of Mr. Outwood set him fizzing off on the trail once more. Mr. Outwood had caught sight of the little pile of soot in the grate. He bent down to inspect it. Dear me, he said, I must remember to have the chimneys swept. It should have been done before. Mr. Downing's eye. Rolling in a fine frenzy from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, also focused itself on the pile of soot, and a thrill went through him. Soot in the fireplace. Smith washing his hands. You know my methods, my dear Watson. Apply them. Mr. Downing's mind at that moment contained one single thought and that thought was what ho for the chimney. He dived forward with a rush, nearly knocking Mr. Outward off his feet, and thrust an arm up into the unknown. An avalanche of soot fell upon his hand and wrist, but he ignored it, for at the same instant his fingers had closed upon what he was seeking. Ah, he said. I thought as much. You were not quite clever enough, after all, Smith. No, sir said P. Smith patiently. We all make mistakes. You would have done better, Smith, not to have given me all this trouble. You have done yourself no good by it. It's been great fun, though. Sir argued P. Smith. Fun. Mr. Downing laughed grimly. You may have reason to change your opinion of what constitutes, his voice failed as his eye fell on the all-black toe of the boot. He looked up, and caught P. Smith's benevolent gaze. He straightened himself and brushed a bead of perspiration from his face with the back of his hand. Unfortunately, he used the sooty hand, 
and the result was like some gruesome burlesque of a nigger minstrel. Did you put that boot there, Smith? He asked slowly. Did you put that boot there, Smith? Yes, sir. Then what did you mean by putting it there, roared Mr. Downing. Animal spirits, sir, said Smith. What? Animal spirits, sir. What Mr. Downing would have replied to this one cannot tell, though one can guess roughly. For, just as he was opening his mouth, Mr. Outward, Catching sight of his jerkwin like countenance, intervened. My dear Downing, he said, your face. It is positively covered with soot, positively. You must come and wash it. You are quite black. Really, you present a most curious appearance, most. Let me show you the way to my room. In all times of storm and tribulation there comes a breaking point, a point where the spirit definitely refuses to battle any longer against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Mr. Downing could not bear up against this crowning blow. He went down beneath it. In the language of the ring, he took the count. It was the knockout. Soot, he murmured weakly. Soot. Your face is covered, my dear fellow, quite covered. It certainly has a faintly sooty aspect, sir said Smith. His voice roused the sufferer to one last flicker of spirit. You will hear more of this, Smith he said. I say you will hear more of it. Then he allowed Mr. Outwood to lead him out to a place where there were towels, soap, and sponges. When they had gone, Smith went to the window, and hauled in the string. He felt the calm afterglow which comes to the general after a successfully conducted battle. It had been trying, of course for a man of refinement, and it had cut into his afternoon, but on the whole it had been worth it. The problem now was what to do with the painted boot. It would take a lot of cleaning, he saw, even if he could get hold of the necessary implements for cleaning it. And he rather doubted if he would be able to do so. Edmund the boot boy, worked in some mysterious cell, far from the madding crowd, at the back of the house. In the boot cupboard downstairs there would probably be nothing likely to be of any use. His fears were realized. The boot cupboard was empty. It seemed to him that, for the time being, the best thing he could do would be to place the boot in safe hiding, until he should have thought out a scheme. Having restored the basket to its proper place, accordingly, he went up to the study again, and placed the red-toed boot in the chimney, at about the same height where Mr. Downing had found the other. Nobody would think of looking there a second time and it was improbable that Mr. Outwood really would have the chimneys swept, as he had said. The odds were that he had forgotten about it already. Smith went to the bathroom to wash his hands again, with the feeling that he had done a good day's work. Chapter LII On the trail again the most massive minds are apt to forget things at times. The most adroit plotters make their little mistakes. P Smith was no exception to the rule. He made the mistake of not telling Mike of the afternoon's happenings. 
it was not altogether forgetfulness. P. Smith was one of those people who like to carry through their operations entirely by themselves. Where there is only one inner secret the secret is more liable to remain unrevealed. There was nothing, he thought, to be gained from telling Mike. He forgot what the consequences might be if he did not. So P. Smith kept his own counsel, with the result that Mike went over to school on the Monday morning in pumps. Edmund, summoned from the hinterland of the house to give his opinion why only one of Mike's boots was to be found, had no views on the subject. He seemed to look on it as one of those things which no fellow can understand. S. One of them. Mr. Jackson he said, as if he hoped that Mike might be satisfied with a compromise. 1. What's the good of that, Edmund, you chump? I can't go over to school in one boot. Edmund turned this over in his mind, and then said, No, sir as much as to say, I may have lost a boot, but... Thank goodness, I can still understand sound reasoning. Well, what am I to do? Where is the other boot? Don't know, Mr. Jackson replied Edmund to both questions. Well, I mean, oh, dash it, there's the bell. And Mike sprinted off in the pumps he stood in. It is only a deviation from those ordinary rules of school life, which one observes naturally and without thinking, that enables one to realize how strong public school prejudices really are. At a school, for instance, where the regulations say that coats only of black or dark blue are to be worn, a boy who appears one day in even the most respectable and unostentatious brown finds himself looked on with a mixture of awe and repulsion, which would be excessive if he had sandbagged the headmaster. So in the case of boots. School rules decree that a boy shall go to his form room in boots. There is no real reason why, if the day is fine. He should not wear shoes, should he prefer them. But, if he does, the thing creates a perfect sensation. Boys say, Great Scott, what have you got on? Masters say, Jones, what are you wearing on your feet? In the few minutes which elapse between the assembling of the form for call-over and the arrival of the form master, some wag is sure either to stamp on the shoes, accompanying the act with some satirical remark, or else to pull one of them off, and inaugurate an impromptu game of football with it. There was once a boy who went to school one morning in elastic-sided boots. Mike had always been coldly distant in his relations to the rest of his form, looking on them, with a few exceptions, as worms, and the form, since his innings against Downings on the Friday, had regarded Mike with respect. So that he escaped the ragging he would have had to undergo at WRYKYN in similar circumstances. It was only Mr. Downing who gave trouble. There is a sort of instinct which enables some masters to tell when a boy in their form is wearing shoes instead of boots, just as people who dislike cats always know when one is in a room with them. They cannot see it, but they feel it in their bones. Mr. Downing was perhaps the most bigoted anti-shoeist in the whole list of English schoolmasters. He waged war remorselessly against shoes. Satire, abuse, lines, detention, 
every weapon was employed by him in dealing with their wearers. It had been the late Dunster's practice always to go over to school in shoes when, as he usually did, he felt shaky in the morning's lesson. Mr. Downing always detected him in the first five minutes, and that meant a lecture of anything from ten minutes to a quarter of an hour on untidy habits and boys who looked like loafers, which broke the back of the morning's work nicely. On one occasion, when a particularly tricky bit of Livy was on the bill of fare, Dunster had entered the form room in heel-less Turkish bath slippers, of a vivid crimson, and the subsequent proceedings, including his journey over to the house to change the heel-less atrocities, had seen him through very nearly to the quarter to eleven interval. Mike, accordingly, had not been in his place for three minutes when Mr. Downing, stiffening like a pointer, called his name. Yes, sir, said Mike. What are you wearing on your feet, Jackson? Pumps, sir. You are wearing pumps. Are you not aware that pumps are not the proper things to come to school in? Why are you wearing pumps? The form leaning back against the next row of desks, settled itself comfortably for the address from the throne. I have lost one of my boots, sir. A kind of gulp escaped from Mr. Downing's lips. He stared at Mike for a moment in silence. Then, turning to Stone, he told him to start translating. Stone, who had been expecting at least ten minutes' respite, was taken unawares. When he found the place in his book and began to construe, he floundered hopelessly. But, to his growing surprise and satisfaction, the form master appeared to notice nothing wrong. He said yes, yes mechanically and finally that will do whereupon Stone resumed his seat with the feeling that the age of miracles had returned. Mr. Downing's mind was in a whirl. His case was complete. Mike's appearance in shoes, with the explanation that he had lost a boot, eated the chain.